Okay, we're going to continue looking at for loops in processing. And let's begin uh, today's lesson with uh, this example right here called Fanning Outlines on page 43 in the text. Okay, so we want to draw a pattern like this. And we're going to use for loop to do it. So let's see how we can do that. Here's the, the sketch right here for doing that. And I'll copy here. You know, that's going to appear in it. Uh, let me just copy it into pieces. Okay, here's the first. And then here's the second. There we go. Okay, so uh, we open up the window. We set the stroke weight of the lines we draw to be 2. Here's our for loop. I need to put a space in there or it doesn't execute. Let me put in a few extra spaces, make it easier to read. <clears throat> so each time through the for loop, it draws a line. And uh, the for loop executes all the code between uh, this bracket and this bracket right here. And um, let's see how this for loop goes. It begins with the value i equal 20. And then it keeps incrementing i and continues. The loop will execute as long as the value of i is less than 400. Um, and then each time through the loop, we increase the value of i by 20. So how many times should this loop execute? Well, 20 goes into 420 times. But the last time, uh, the last value that i that's computed here is going to be when uh, i is 400. And when i is 400, the loop will not execute because 400 is not less than 400. So it looks to me like this for loop should execute not 20 times, but 19 times. OK, let's run the code and see what happens. So here we go. Here's the code. Now, see what's going on is that the line we draw, the x coordinate depends on i. And then i is what's getting increased. So each time through, we jump, increase the value of the x coordinate by 20. The y coordinate um, of the initial point is 0. That doesn't change. The x coordinate of the second point on the line goes to i plus i over 2. So it's a little bit larger, which is why the slope on these lines continues to fan out like that. The y coordinate stays at 80. So the, the distance down from the top of the window stays at 80. So the two y coordinates are fixed, and it's the x coordinates that change slowly. Now, I could, uh, what happens if I change this to 50 instead of 20? Well, it seems we're going to go through fewer increments on the for loop because i will increase faster, and therefore it'll get to 400 faster. So let's see. Here we go. So just as I uh, suggested, that appears to be what happened. So that's an example of fanning out lines. The next example modifies this ever so slightly. So we come down here. It's called kinking lines. So we do these lines, but we draw another line from the end point on down. So we want to draw a second line where the first point of the line is here, and then it ends somewhere down here. So let's see how that will execute. So kinking lines. So this is the code right here. OK. So let me copy. There we go. And um, let me add in some spaces here. Let me take this in. OK. And 
and um, now we can put the bracket here okay now in the book they put it down on the next line um, but this should still run we'll see but let's see what's happening notice it the the first segment begins at I and ends at I plus I over 2 on the x-axis which is what we had the previous example the second line the, should begin at this x value and it does and this y value so it's the same point x and y but then it ends at a uh, I at a x value where we go to I times 1.2 so instead of I plus I over 2 it goes to this value and then the Y value is constant and we can run this oh now what is it not like oh yeah look at this see integer I I should have put a space in there let me put in some more spaces just to make it easier to read there we go now run okay no so like I said this didn't cause a problem and then here's the code we draw the first line and then where the first line ends is where we begin the second line and it goes all the way down to the bottom of the window bottom of the window is at y equal 120 and that's where the end of the second line is y equal 120 okay so two lines one for loop and uh, Notice also, let me just mention this here, we could put the uh, bracket right there if we wanted. And we run it, and it still runs. Now, notice, however, if I take this, move it out there, and then put it here, this also works. Okay. So, you've seen there are a number of places here we can put these brackets and uh, the code will still run without an error. Okay, now, now we're going to put two for loops, one inside the other, so you can see what happens there. It's called embed one loop in another. We want to draw a pattern like this. So let me examine what this does here, and then we'll execute it over here. And we set up our window. We set the background in the window to be black. We don't do strokes. We don't put a boundary on the circles that we're going to be drawing. And then we have a for loop, which increments through the variable y, which presumably will be the y coordinate in the circles that we draw. And then inside y, the y for loop and then increments through the value of x and, and goes through different x values. So what's uh, happening here is first we're going to pick value for y, y equals 0, which is right there. So we're setting, we're going to set the center of the ellipse at y equals 0. So we set y equals 0 and then we go through a whole bunch of x values. So what happens then is we do this circle, and then for the next x value, we do that circle, and then that x value, that x value, and so on. We go all the way across there. When that loop is finished, so when the x loop is finished executing, then we go back and we increment to the next value of y, which brings us down here. And then we run through all of the x's, like that. So the outside loop increments more slowly than the inside loop. So we pick a value for y, run through the x's, and when we're done running through the x's, we pick another value for y, and so on. So let me put this code down. You can see what's going on here. Okay, first we'll do this, copy, there we go then I'm going to do these two down here 
like that. And let me put it on another line just to make it clear, like that. Okay, now I need to put a space there, or I'll get an error. I'll put a space here. Won't give me an error if I don't have those these two spaces. Just makes it easier to read. Put a space here, or I get an error. Make it easier to read here. And then we move this down here. There we go, like that. And let me move this down. Now is a good time to start talking about standards we use in formatting loops. Typically, if we have loops embedded in one another, we use indentation to make it clear what's happening here. So we might do something like that for the inner loop. So the X loop, everything is indented. And then so this is the the bracket for the X loop. See, I click on this and then that highlights. I click on this, then this highlights. So this allows us to see that all of this code here goes for the inner loop. And then th these are the boundaries on the outer loop. So that's standard. You see, they have indentation over here. Now what they're doing here is a little bit different and I don't think the details are that important but we do that okay so we put these lines of code here inside like that so first loop outer loop inner loop indented a little bit the lines of code in here are indented even more this lines up with that four so it's clear this goes with the inner for loop right here. Okay, this lines up with this for. So that's typically the way it's done. Uh, and this way of formatting code when we write it down doesn't change the execution of the code. But uh, if we do this all the time, it makes it easier for us to read and interpret the code. Okay, so let me run this code. So here we have our array of circles on a black field. If I change some things, so for example, if I make this 60 and run, see what happens, our Y spacing increases. Now I can go back to 40 and then make this 60 and then run and our X spacing increases. We can make them both 60. And we have that. Okay, now, um, so this is embedded for loops and a little bit on formatting our programs to make it easier to read. You know, back when I first started doing programming, it was back in the late 60s. Um, this was this formatting was not uh, a standard procedure. OK, now one more thing and then I'm done. Um, suppose we don't embed the for loops, but we put one for loop after the other. What happens then? So let me copy this. Oh, that didn't work. Well, yes, it did. Okay. Now, let me move this down like that. Put a space here, space here, space here, space here, space here, space here. there, tab moving over there, and uh, we don't have to indent that far here to make it work, there, I'll do a little bit more, 
there like that. And um, I pull this in there like that. Now, in addition to using indenting, I also like to use spaces to make the formatting more clear. So I might put a space there and a space here to separate these two blocks of code quite clearly. Okay, now let's examine what goes on with this set of code. We set our window, background is black, we don't draw uh, a line around the edge of the circles. This loop starts at y equals 0 and increments y. So notice that, remember that height is in fact the uh, the y extent of the window. So we're going up until the circle is less than height plus 45. So this, this, this is an interesting choice. You might want to investigate what happens here. Then we, each time through the loop, we increment y by 40. We're filling, um, uh, filling the, um, uh, the pattern here. Here, here we go. Uh, we could just fill with a gray level. We're filling with, um, 255, 140, and uh, we only have two numbers in there. So what's going on with that? And um, then we do an ellipse, uh, or a circle in this case. The x-coordinate is 0. We're changing the y-coordinate. And then this is the x and y diameter of the circle. So since we're incrementing y, what this piece of code does is it does these circles down here. So first this is done. Okay, so let me, uh, let's just run that piece of code and see what happens. Now I'm going to comment out these statements. Remember I said we use comments to get rid of statements to run the code without those statements. Uh, when we're experimenting with the code. So let me just run this. And I run, and we're just getting these circles down here. Okay, pretty interesting. Now, uh, we only have two, uh, uh, two numbers in the fill. Suppose I did a comma, put in a third number right here. What happens? So we're changing that color. Okay, now let's take that third number out and just keep that number and run it. And that is, of course, white. 255 is white. Now, we had 255, 140 a minute ago. Suppose we put 255 and 50 like that. So this is making these things darker. So this is entering what? We only putting two numbers in there. And we are still getting sort of gray level here. Um, this is red, green. Now if I put a common zero, is that the same thing as not putting a number? I don't think so. Look at that. We get an orange. Okay, now, so, this is an interesting little experiment. Play with that and see what it's doing with the numbers. Now, it seems to me I could just go in here and make this 125 or 128 or something like that, which is just a gray level, and I pretty much get the same thing. There, look at that. Okay, now, let me take away this commenting. And this. And then finally this. And then run this code. Right there. So, let me change this to 200.
and run it. Okay, now. Let me go back to 40. and run this like that. So this is just doing a gray level down here. This is not doing just a gray level. I'm putting one number and then this is what? Perhaps just putting that second number indicates a transparency. So I put 40 as I make this number smaller those circles get darker. Suppose I put 200 here and run. The circles get much brighter. And then I put 255 like that. And this would be then completely transparent. And, they, and I get the white. Now, so it looks like if we just put two numbers, what we're doing is we're setting the transparency. One number sets the gray level. Okay, so uh, several different things appear in this. This is what happens when we run for loops not embedded in one another, but in sequence. You see the for loops run pretty independently of one another. And um, it's uh, uh, so embedding gives us an array of circles and not embedding gives us a row and a column. So with that, um, I'm done with this lesson. We'll pick it up next time.